Hello everyone, once again this is Pastor Terry Reese with the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armall, Pennsylvania. Once again it is our pleasure and our great privilege to have you with us on our YouTube channel. And once again we're talking about the attributes of God and right now we're focusing upon those distinguishing characteristics and properties that have to do with the greatness of God. Those attributes that are what we call incommunicable, meaning that they are unique unto God. They cannot be communicated unto any creature. Uh, amongst these attributes would include um, the fact that God is self-existent, that is, he is life in and, in and of himself. He is the power of being in and of himself, and he is the source of all life. He is independent and not dependent upon anything else. That makes him absolutely unique and transcendent. Also, God is eternal. He is unchangeable. He is omnipresent, meaning he is present everywhere throughout the universe. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He is omnipotent. He has all power over his creation. He is perfect. That is, he is everything that God should be. He is infinite, and he is incomprehensible. Uh, but the attribute that we're focusing on today is the third of these that I have listed, the fact that God is immutable or unchangeable. He is unchanging. And uh, I want to, uh, first of all, define what we mean when we say that God is unchanging or immutable. So when... Uh, you think about the word immutable, the English dictionary defines that term in this way, something that will never change or cannot be changed. Something that will never change or cannot be changed. Well, is there anything in the universe that uh, can be described absolutely in those terms? Certainly no creature, certainly nothing that has been created. Uh, if there's anything constant, it is the fact that everything that is part of this creation is in a state of constant flux and change. Each of us are constantly changing. Our hair is growing progressively grayer and our health is going downwards as we uh, fast approach a date with uh, our own final mortality. We are in a state of constant change. And the universe we live in is, a st is in a state of constant change, a state of uh, constant decay, uh, a state of constant energy depletion. It's in a downward spiral. Uh, after all, this is a fallen universe, but things are constantly in a state of change and motion. But, as we said, these attributes that we've listed, uh, these are things that are unique unto God. They are incommunicable, and God does not change. As a theological term, the term immutable uh, can be defined this way. Uh, when we say that God is immutable, we mean that there is no change within the nature, within the character, within the mind, or the sovereign will of God. He never has and never will become anything greater or less than what he is today. And uh, bound in this concept is the fact that he does not learn, he does not grow, he does not develop, he does not change, he does not improve, nor does he evolve. Uh, he does not mutate in any form. As far as God not learning, uh, he doesn't need to learn. Uh, he is omniscient. He has always known everything about everything. 
uh, he uh, there is no need for him to learn because he already knows everything and he always has already known everything. When we speak of God's immutability, we are referring to God's freedom from all change, emphasizing God's changeless perfection and his divine constancy. Um, so uh, when we say God is immutable, then we're saying that he is unchanging in terms of his character, his will, and his covenant promises. When he makes an unconditional covenant promise, uh, you better believe it will come to pass. Uh, the great Reformed theologian Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology uh, succinctly uh, defined divine immutability, immutability in these terms. He says, quote, that perfection of God by which he does not change in his being, in his perfections, purposes, or promises. Now this, uh, this concept of immutability or unchangeability, it really defines all of God's other attributes. Um, God is immutably, unchangeably wise, immutably and unchangeably merciful, good, and gracious. And God is also eternally and immutably omnipotent. You know, he'll never be less powerful or, or never have less control over his creation than he does now. He is eternally and immutably, unchangeably omnipresent. What he is today, he will always be. And he is immutably omniscient. He will never develop a, a case of Alzheimer's, a divine Alzheimer's, and forget that which he knows today. So this uh, attribute of immutability uh, characterizes and defines the other divine attributes. Now when we say God is uh, immutable and unchanging, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, those, uh, those things that uh, we have just discussed, uh, no change within his nature, character, mind, or sovereign will. That doesn't mean that he is immobile. Uh, it doesn't mean that God is stagnant. When we say that God is unchanging, that doesn't mean that he is unchanging in terms of, or invariable in terms of his attitudes or in terms of his actions. As we'll see, uh, when one of God's creatures sins, an unchanging God, a God who is always what he is, must change in terms of his attitude towards that creature or uh, God does act he isn't sitting in a just in a placid or again stagnant state he is a God who acts so when we say that God is unchanging we're not referring to uh, attitude or action um, let's look at some scripture before we go any further and get into some of these issues um, in terms of the scripture, uh, think about the, the meaning of the divine name. We already related that to God's eternality, but it also relates to his immutability. In Exodus 3.14, we read, God said to Moses, after Moses, of course, had requested uh, to know by what name he should be referring to God, God said, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So notice again that God is not in a state of becoming. He is. The divine name implies his immutability. He is. He's already arrived. He's not in a state of flux or a state of evolving or becoming something. Let's uh, also note that uh, in terms of our scriptures that um, God's, even as God is unchanging and immutable, so too are his promises immutable. In Numbers 23, uh, 19, we read this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Change. He has said, as, as he said, and he will not do it, 
or is he spoken and he will not make it good? We can see here uh, in terms of these questions posed. Uh, uh, the answer is God is a solid rock. He is utterly dependable. And uh, even as his promises are unchanging, so too are his thoughts and his plans. So in Psalm 33, verse 11, uh, we read, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Uh, furthermore, as uh, we can see in, term, uh, in terms of God's immutability, how this, uh, how this affected his relationship unto his chosen people, the Old Testament, Israel. God's holy and unchangeable nature ensured the doom of the city of Jerusalem for its sins. We read in Ezekiel twenty four fourteen, I, the Lord, have spoken. It is coming, and I will act. I will not relent, and I will not pity, and I will not be sorry. According to your ways and according to your deeds, I will judge you, declares the Lord God. You see, God's immutable and holy nature demanded a response, a response to Israel's many sins. Here was a chosen people who had been given so much from the hand of God. No other nation had uh, received what Israel had received. They must, therefore, uh, since they were given much, uh, they must expect that they will receive greater judgment. Um, also, while it's true that God's immutable nature ensured discipline upon his chosen people, his same nature also uh, demands that Israel, uh, uh, his eternal promises to Israel be realized. In other words, God's immutable and unchanging nature is Israel's hope. We read here in Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O sons of ja therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. The uh, immutability of God thus becomes a source of uh, uh, warning unto His people that, uh, as a loving Father, He must discipline because He is immutably holy, and yet it also is a uh, a source of comfort that when He gives. Uh, unconditional promises unto his people, he will fulfill those promises. The uh, Another uh, scripture which uh, speaks of God's immutability, speaks of the Father's immutability, uh, James 1.17, a well-known passage uh, which appears in uh, this context. Uh, in the first chapter of James, for example, in verses 2 and 3, uh, we learn that testing is something that uh, is something that is good for God's people. It aids them in their development. But we get down here to verse uh, uh, into the verses that precede verse 17. Okay, we read that um, temptation that does not come from the hand of God. That when a man is tempted. That is our own sin nature at work. God does not make anyone sin. So James wants us to understand that while testing comes from God, uh, the temptation that arises in our hearts uh, that uh, that is not that is not a, that is not God. That is our own sin natures. So we should uh, understand uh, what's going on in our hearts when temptation comes. And so he writes here in James 1.17, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Again, we see the immutability of God. And what is true of the Father 
is equally true of the Son, who is co-equal with the Father and co-eternal. The Son, who is true deity. In Hebrews 13.8, we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those who would dare doubt the deity of Jesus Christ, how could you say this of any being, any person who is not divine? The same yesterday, today, and forever. We can only speak of God in those terms, friends. Then, of course, we're referring here to the, the Son with regard to his deity. Obviously, in his humanity, yes, Jesus was born and he grew and he advanced in knowledge and wisdom in terms of his human nature. But his human nature is uh, joined in one person with his divine nature. And in his divine nature, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, um, in terms of this matter of divine immutability, people will ask then, uh, particularly uh, people who uh, doubt um, the uh, infinite nature of God, those who are more comfortable, say, with a finite God, like the open theists uh, who we've talked about uh, in this series who deny things like God's omniscience and so forth and his eternality. Um, how do you deal with a passage such as 1 Samuel 15 verses 10 through 11? We read there, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret or repent that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commandments. Um, how can we say then that God is immutable if he repents of doing something? Or it's like he's changed his mind. Uh, various uh, scriptures that seem to indicate God changes his mind. Does that not mean that God is mutable, changing, as opposed to immutable? The context of the scripture, of course, is when King Saul failed to follow God's instructions, which were to utterly annihilate, destroy the Amalekite nation, the wicked Amalekite nation, and Saul did not uh, do so. He preserved the life of its king, and he refused to uh, offer all of the animals as fire offerings and so forth. He did not complete the task that he was given. With regard uh, to uh, these uh, scriptures like this that uh, speak of God changing his mind, uh, this, these, they do not mean that God changes his mind in the human sense where on uh, one hand you were determined and resolved to do this, but then oh, something changed within me and uh, oh, I, I changed my mind. I, I, I repent of what I was doing. I goofed up. That's not the sense in which these kind of passages are talking. Note, uh, if you're at 1 Samuel 15, that in verse 29, that same chapter, uh, when after uh, Saul pleads uh, to Samuel, uh, uh, after Samuel pronounces that God has removed the kingship from him, uh, we read uh, Samuel saying in verse 29, Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. For he's not a man that he should change his mind. So whatever the meaning of this word repent is in verse 11, it does not mean in, uh, change, God changes in the way human beings change their minds. So what does verse 11 mean uh, that uh, when God says, I regret or repent that I've made Saul king? Um, with regard to verse 11, let's look at it this way. God, an immutable God, an unchanging God, changes his dealings with man when changeable man changes towards God. Now, previously, Saul had been in obedience. 
But now he was in a state of extreme disobedience. And in that sort of circumstance, an unchanging God, a God who is unchangingly holy, and a God who has unchanging purposes, an unchanging God, a God who is in himself unchanging, must change in his dealings with changing men in order to remain unchangeable in his holy character. Thus, we could say God, quote, changes his mind whenever men sin, that demands judgment, or whenever men repent, that demands forgiveness, or God, um, uh, God's plan often is in response off to intercessory prayer. We pray, and God says he hears our prayers, and he responds to our prayers in accordance with his own will. But yes, prayer changes things. Prayer is something that uh, is within the plan and of God. It is something that exists under the sovereignty of God. So when we earnestly pray, it matters. So God, an unchanging God, does respond when men sin, when men repent, and when men pray. So our lives and our actions do matter, is what we're saying. But God himself, in terms of who he is, what he is, in terms of his sovereign eternal plan, his sovereign eternal unconditional promises, these things do not change. Now let's give you uh, some examples here. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, we read this. At one moment, I may speak about a nation or a kingdom to uproot it, pull it down, or destroy it. But if that nation about which I spoke turns from its evil way, I'll change my mind about the disaster I had planned for it." Unquote. So God is saying it really does matter if we repent, and that's part of his eternal plan. You know, God is omniscient, and he, has, he is eternal. He, he, he knows from the very beginning. He knows from all of eternity. He has always known whether or not a nation or an individual would repent. And uh, his divine, eternal plan, his immutable plan, you know, it's, it's all geared around what he has always known. Um, think about Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. There we read, Yet even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil." Unquote. Yes, if the Israelites would but fast, weep, and mourn, and rend their hearts, not just some outward show of rending their garments, but rend their hearts, it matters, and God says he would relent of his plans to bring judgment upon them if they would but turn to him and repent. And uh, you see examples of this in the prophecy of uh, Amos. Uh, um, Amos, uh, the Lord had spoken uh, to Amos about bringing a judgment of locusts upon the nation and a judgment of fire. And uh, Amos pleaded on behalf of his nation, and we read in Amos 7.3 and also 7.6, The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. And uh, also we read in uh, Jonah 3.10, uh, you remember the uh, nation of Nineveh was under, the, uh, the people, the men of Nineveh were under the uh, judgment of God, and Jonah was commanded to preach against his will and desire. He was commanded to preach to the men of Nineveh, and uh, the men of Nineveh repented. 
And we read in Jonah 3.10, When God saw their deeds, they, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented or repented concerning the calamity in which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Once again, uh, an example that our activity matters. Our seeking the Lord's face and forgiveness matters. And this should be a great encouragement to us that though God is immutable and unchanging, he does respond to our faith and to our repentance and to our prayers. Um, in James 5, Verses 16 through 18, we read, Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the earth gave rain, and the earth brought forth her, root, her fruit, unquote. See the power of prayer. Elijah was a man like us, and he prayed, and great things happened. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, 16, a good memory verse for all of us. Um, the uh, also think about first john 1 9 another classic passage i'm sure you know if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and friends this is uh, the kind of attitude that we need to constantly have uh, as we walk through the this this world, the wilderness of this world, and we it's a dirty world and we get dirty all the time. And to keep the lines of communication and fellowship open with our God, we uh, we need to be in a state of constant confession and uh, a state of constant uh, washing our feet, as in the metaphorical sense of James 13, uh, that we uh, uh, that we might be cleansed. Now. In terms of the uh, the practical applications of this uh, this great uh, this great uh, this great doctrine that God is immutable, that is the practical blessings that flow into our lives and the assurances that we have in our hearts. So let's go through a few of these. Um, number one, God's immutability, His unchanging nature, is the guarantee of blessing for His people. Again. I uh, once again quote Psalm 33, and I, not only do I quote verse 11 this time, but also quote verse 12. We read, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. You know, it is a great blessing to be one of the people of God. And it's a blessing rooted in the constancy of God's character and his being and his purposes. He does not speak idle words. Secondly, um, you know, if, we, if you believe correctly in what the Bible teaches concerning the Hebrew people and God's... Uh, plan for the ages and his future plans for the nation of Israel and how this relates to the end times. Uh, this is a very important issue. Uh, the survival of God's chosen people, Israel. You know, God made some unconditional pl promises to the Hebrew people through their fathers, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. And uh, for those of us who are not of the Hebrew race, these promises are important unto us as well, because if God would not keep his unchanging, unconditional promises to them, then uh, we would have to worry that he's not going to keep his promises to us. But he will keep his promises to national Israel, and this is guaranteed by what? By his immutability, his unchanging nature. 
Again, I will quote Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. You know, that's the only reason that the sons of Israel, the sons of Jacob, uh, have not been consumed and will not be consumed. I mean, their entire history is one of national disobedience. Moses called them a stiff-necked people. Um, the um, <clears throat> nation of Israel uh, forsaking the Lord throughout its history, not trusting the Lord throughout its history, uh, not uh, not obeying godly kings, uh, being often being led by godless kings and false prophets, not not listening to the true prophets, uh, stoning the true prophets, putting them in stocks, sawing them in half, all these terrible things. Uh, nation of Israel involved in uh, pagan religions and in the destruction of the innocents, and then finally their ultimate stumbling. Uh, not only chasing after false gods, but ultimately failing to recognize the one whom God has sent, their true Messiah, and the salvation, the exclusive salvation that he brings. What a disaster their history has been. But yet, they are not consumed. And they will not be consumed. Not because of that they're better than any other people or any special virtue that they have, but because I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O sons of you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God made uh, great blessings to uh, uh, great promises to Abraham, and um, Think about uh, the example of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 through 14, where we see the example of Moses praying in intercession for his people. You know, the children of Israel had sinned greatly, and God threatened the entire nation with destruction. Step aside, Moses, I'm going to wipe out this people, and I'll uh, raise up a new people out of you, a new nation. And uh, Moses uh, prayed to God in intercession. Moses, uh, the great warrior of intercessory prayer, and he prayed, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Uh, Moses reminded God of these promises. And, uh, of course, we read then, So God changed his mind. He repented. Changed his mind about the harm by which he said he would do to his people. Now, you have to understand something. Uh, God made an unchanging promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, he fully intended to keep that promise. And... Uh, that promise cannot be broken. And yet, Moses' intercessory prayer mattered because that was part of the means through which God fulfilled his promise unto his chosen people. Marvelous, isn't it, the interplay between divine sovereignty and divine omniscience on the one hand and uh, and on the other hand, uh, human activity, which God uses as means to fulfill his eternal purposes. It's far beyond our comprehension how, how God does these things, but he does because he is God. So God has his eternal plan, and yet our lives and our behavior and our prayers matter. They're part of God's plan. They're part of the means through which, which he does great things and things that um, that he uh, eternally has promised um, the uh, you know the same is true when you think about the doctrine of uh, election we're not going to get into those depths right now but uh, yes it is true that uh, uh, salvation yes is a matter of specific divine election that God has chosen a people for himself uh, before the creation of the worlds, specific individuals who, who, through whom he will impart eternal life. And yet, it is so important that we pray in intercession 
for our loved ones, that God would stir their dead, empty hearts and open their hearts so that they might see their need for salvation. Again, that interplay between divine activity and our work of prayer and evangelism. We're called upon to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, uh, pre to follow the Great Commission, to make disciples of all the nations, to teach everything that Jesus commanded, to uh, evangelize. And uh, no one's going to be saved unless uh, a preacher is sent. And yet, God's purposes and election will be realized. And uh, all we can do is just marvel at the greatness of God in his eternal plan in making us uh, instruments of his eternal activity. How awesome. Well, also, an, another point, a third point, uh, which uh, third applicable point in terms of our benefit with regard to this doctrine of God's immutability is, uh, again, to remind ourselves that when we are tempted, it is not God who is holy and who is unchanging and who, if we are his people, he seeks what is best for us. It's not God who's making us sin. It is our own sin natures which are at work. And again, I invite you to study James chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, where we read, Let uh, no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God! For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So remember this, that uh, God is good and God is holy, and he wants what is best for his children. Uh, he's not the devil. He's not our enemy. And uh, we must, as we, as we wrestle with temptation, we must understand what the dynamic uh, really is. Yes, this has come into our lives for a purpose, and so we, uh, and so we pray, let us pray, not let us not be led into temptation. And yet it is not God that is making us sin. Um, a fourth point, a uh, fourth benefit, a fourth practical application of this doctrine is that uh, it's always important for us to remember that he, he is always constant. We have our ups and we have our downs. We have our good days and we have our bad days. Uh, these things do not change him nor his eternal plan. And the great verse for that a blessed verse, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Another real good memory verse. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. <laughs> what, what more is there to be said for divine immutability and the blessings that flow from it than, than that great verse, Second uh, Timothy 2, 13. Fifthly, uh, divine immutability is something that really underlines some of the key characteristics of a godly person. Now, yes, only God is immutable, but uh, 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 certainly we, uh, as we recognize that uh, this is not only an attribute of divine greatness, but it also has a moral quality to it. It's something that uh, we should reflect upon as uh, something we would desire to cultivate within ourselves. Uh, the idea of stability. The idea of being a reliable person, the idea of being immovable in the face of obstacles, the idea of being dependable, that other people can count upon us. These are all godly virtues that we would do well, brethren, to cultivate. Uh, sixthly, in terms of the practical benefits that come to us through this doctrine of immutability, uh, it serves as a continuing assurance that Though the whole world turns against us and betrays us most cruelly, we still have one true friend, 
one really dependable ally that we can always count on. That's the person of God. And friends, that is some of the greatest comfort that God does not change. You know, uh, I will disappoint you. You will disappoint me because all of us uh, have our failings. All of us have our bad, our negative characteristics, our bad days, our lapses. We are not fully dependable. Even the most sanctified saint will stumble and disappoint those around him, including those that he loves. You know, friends, uh, can go further than that even. One of life's most shattering experiences is this. To one day discover that a person that you invested a great deal of trust in, a person that you loved, in the end turns out to be a traitor, a backstabber. And that this person has changed in terms of his relationship with you. Maybe once this person loved you, but now he doesn't. Maybe this, uh, this person was just like a brother to you, and now he's far away, and he's done things to your harm. That's one of the most shattering experiences in life, isn't it? To be betrayed by a friend, or by a lover, or by a spouse. Nothing can hurt more than this. But you know, when our Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself this flesh, he experienced betrayal. You know, Psalm 41 verse 9 speaks uh, with uh, messianic anticipation of the sufferings of Messiah. And we read here in Psalm 41 verse 9, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And we see the fulfillment of that in the life of Jesus, don't we? Luke 22, verse 48. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Our Lord took upon himself this flesh in in very real terms. He became a real member of the human race. His humanity was not partial. It was total and genuine. And uh, he knows. He knows what it is to be betrayed, to be hurt, to experience the, uh, the ultimate shattering experience of a best friend turning on you. But isn't it a comfort to know that this friend, God, though all the rest may betray you and stab you in the back and just walk away from you, there's one that if you know him, and he is your friend, he will never, ever leave you or forsake you or abandon you or betray you or betray your confidence in him. You have one friend who will always be a friend. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who said to his disciples, now I call you friends. What a blessing. Can there be a greater blessing than to know that God in the person of Christ is immutable? That Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever and ever and ever. The same Jesus. The same dependable Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, how thankful we are that we know the Lord Jesus. That there is this one who will never disappoint. That there is this one who will always be a friend to the friendless. Whether it's convenient to be our friend or inconvenient, he will always be our friend if we are covered in his blood, if we have received him as Savior and placed our trust in him. He will be with us throughout all of eternity, and he will make good all of his promises to us, that he will bring us to everlasting life if we are but trusting in what he has done for us on the cross, taking our sins upon himself, that his promises are immutable. 
Lord, we're so thankful for these reminders today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, once again, it was a great privilege to be able to come into your home via YouTube. And until next time, may the Lord bless you.